anti-regime activists in the Green Movement. Khamenei has now been supreme leader for the last 26 years. Now he has moved from a guy in his 50s who was quickly given what some would say a battlefield promotion to now an aging and increasingly infer figure who has served in the leader's role far longer than Khomeini did. But as he is finding his feet in the 90s and early 2000s, there are efforts at domestic reforms. There's the presidency of someone named Hassan Rafsanjani, a fabulously wealthy and influential cleric whose family has made a billion dollars in the pistachio industry and other economic assets, who was president from 89 to 97. You guys think of him today as an older person who is sometimes linked with reformist figures. Then the well-known President Khafanik, a cleric and learned student of Western philosophy, who was president from 97 to 2005 and spoke of the need for a dialogue of civilizations. He was the counterpart to Bill Clinton in the 90s, and Khafanik gave a story interview to CNN in which he said, it is time for a rapprochement between our countries. It is time to put aside the coup of 53, to put aside the embassy crisis of 79, and have a dialogue between great civilizations, Western and Persia. After 9-11, in the early days of 9-11, it appeared that this would be further when the Sunni militancy of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, each of whom Iran had poured as an affront to Shi'i principles. And right after 9-11, Iran indicated that it might really now have an opening for a new kind of relationship with the United States. But then was the George W. Bush axis of evil speech in January of 2002, as President Bush's advisors were clearly counseling him otherwise, or saying Iran is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Don't believe it. This is still the country that took over the embassy in 79. And the response was the confrontational new presidency of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad from 2005 to 2013 with his bombastic statements about denying the Holocaust and eradicating Israel and the tyranny of US and Israeli imperialism and a complete shutdown of any type of rapprochement between the United States and Iran and also ever increasing domestic repression like a 2009 re-election of Ahmadinejad, widely believed to have been fixed, and the outpouring of popular dissent called the Green Movement, which was crushed by the Iranian regime. But then, Ahmadinejad's excesses on the world stage have proved to be too much for the Iranian regime, which came to see him as an embarrassment and a liability a destabilizing influence who was not helping Iran. And so in 2013, there was a much different kind of figure. The new reformist president, a sophisticated cleric and intellectual named Hassan Rouhani elected. He's now been in office for a year and a half as the democratically elected counterpart to Ayatollah Khamenei, and it's his government and his foreign minister, Javad Zarif, who are engaged in nuclear negotiations with the P5 at Geneva. And so this leads us to the final question, where do things stand today in terms of evaluating the enduring consequences of February 1st, 79, this day that shook the world, when Khomeini returned to Iran? We have the nuclear negotiations, we have the implosion of Iraq and Syria, each of them neighboring countries of Iran's, in which Iran has a profound strategic interest and in which Iran is heavily engaged, upholding Shi'i-oriented regimes in Damascus and Baghdad against the Sunni militancy of ISIS 
and is thereby a kind of implicit strategic ally of the United States against ISIS, notwithstanding the surface enmity between the United States and Iran. You have the influence of 2015 and 2016 domestic politics in the United States and Israel. Tomorrow's Israeli election. Benjamin Netanyahu, as he seeks to be re-elected prime minister, claims that Iran remains an existential threat. And Prime Minister Netanyahu represents himself as the security leader. I am here to protect you from this country, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Don't let them get away with building a nuclear missile. You guys are also aware that in the United States, Barack Obama has tried to take a negotiation-based position to Iran, which does not sell well on the Republican side of the aisle. Those who say, wolf in sheep's clothing, you must act tough with this country, and indeed, the likely 2016 Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton, who has also staked a lot on being tough on Iran. As you guys can see from the history we've talked about here, being tough on Iran sells well in American domestic politics, and need we also point out in Canadian domestic politics, where Prime Minister Harper has invested a lot of political discourse in that approach, and indeed in closing the Canadian embassy in Tehran not long ago. And the aging and possible infirmity of Khamenei. There's been a lot of talk just this week about the, um, the process that's already unfolding in Iran to pick a potential successor to Khamenei as supreme leader. So I leave you guys with the question, what might the future hold? Given that the Islamic Republic of Iran does not appear to be going away anytime soon, those who are prone to outright demonize Iran often say, this is a country ripe for regime change. The United States and Canada should be doing whatever they can to help sponsor an overthrow of the regime. But of course, one might argue that's exactly the kind of talk that deepens the feeling in Tehran that Western powers are out to get them. And some argue that even for the many opponents of the regime within Iran, and there are many who are dissatisfied with the authoritarianism, with the imposition of moral codes, but would an attempt at regime change not lead to a kind of circle the wagons approach of defending the government, given the very powerful and proud tradition of Iranian nationalism. And then at the same time, we have the fact that Iran is a very powerful country strategically. It still has a strong ideological hold on many in the world who do believe that it is part of the so-called axis of resistance to Western hegemonic imperialism. So what might the future hold? I have absolutely no idea. But I think that the history we've talked about here is all extremely important to inform ourselves in a sensitive and nuanced way about the significance of the Iranian Revolution and the